My name is Jason Gerald, and I am the founder and principal consultant at NextGen Interactions. We focus on emerging technologies such as virtual reality, and that's what I'll be talking today, applied towards um, gaming, entertainment in general, but also a little bit about how some of these technologies can apply towards serious gaming as well. Before I get started, I'm curious, how many of you have um, tried the Oculus Rift? Wow, almost everyone. All right, and how many of you actually are have one that you own yourself? A few of you. Okay, well, the new one's coming out this summer, so maybe you guys are waiting for that. That's going to be going to be even a uh, a better version, the Dev Kit Number Two, and then next maybe in a year or so, the actual consumer version will be coming out. The Dev Kit One that we currently have is pretty cool but it's not quite there yet. We're still, uh, or Oculus, I should say, is still developing that, constantly improving upon that to add new features and such. It's very basic at this point, but you can kind of get an idea when you use the Oculus Rift of what's coming to the consumer virtual reality market. Curious, out of those that had the Rift, are any of you actually developing or content creation or anything with it? A couple people? Okay, great. So you're probably well aware of some of these things, and I'll try to, you know, explain some concepts that I think are important for development. And for those of you kind of considering that, we can give you some ideas when you do start creating and what to do with that. Okay, so I'll just start off with what is virtual reality? Well, I kind of define virtual reality as replacing the real world with computer generated cues. Those cues might be visual cues, of course, is the primary thing, but as you all know with games, things like audio is very important as well. What we add with virtual reality is that also that sense of touch, that sense of proprioception, that I can feel how my head moves instead of just keeping my head still and only having visual and auditory cues. Also, in some cases, we'll do full body tracking for the ideal virtual reality experience. As a simpler version of that might just be tracking the hand so that you can interact with the world. Now, virtual reality is something that's very difficult to explain in words. It's something you have to experience to really get what it's about. And those that have tried it, you probably understand that, but it's hard for me to explain. So I'll show a short video, but first I want to show an example reaction of someone trying virtual reality for the first time. And some of you may have seen this video. This is a 90-year-old grandma trying virtual reality with the Oculus Rift for the first time. And so specifically, of course, you'll see her reaction, but pay attention, careful attention to her words of what she says, how she describes the experience. Oh, this is something else, and I'm so similar I want. Yeah. yeah. Holy mackerel. Yeah, yeah, if I ever explain this to somebody, they won't believe me. <laughs> Pretty much, honestly. They won't and believe me. We're going to do the post again. I am not going to make you. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so I got the clip hooked through the window, right? You me against the post. All right, that's a short version of that. She goes on to say other amazing things as well. That, that video has gotten over 2 million views on YouTube. So a, a massive number of consumers are starting to understand what virtual reality is and starting to imagine what it can actually be capable of. Now, the specific words she used, one phrase was, my friends aren't going to believe this when I tell them. Right, again, it's something you can describe, but you have to experience. Now, if this 90-year-old grandma goes to one of her you know, good friends or a relative and says, yeah, I was in my living room and I was transported to this other place that didn't really exist. If they never heard of virtual reality, what do you think they're gonna think? They're gonna think she's you know, kind of losing it, that they're not going to take her seriously. I'm in one place, but I'm actually in another, a complete other universe. That just sounds crazy. And so something you have to actually see to actually experience that. She also asked the question, am I still where I was? That implies she actually felt that she was present in that other world. That's what we really, something we're trying to strive for in virtual reality is a sense of presence, the sense of being somewhere else other than where you're physically located. She kind of sounded, she was implying that she wasn't sure, oh, am I in my living room or am, am I in this alternate world? And so that's pretty, uh, pretty compelling, pretty convincing when you actually feel like you're somewhere else and you're not sure where you're located. 
Again, this was a very simple demo. This is just the Oculus Rift by itself. There's no no body tracking. She's not really interacting with the world. It's more of a passive experience, and she still had that very uh, surreal experience for herself. Okay, up next, I want to actually show you an example of a virtual reality um, experience. I work with the Birchwix, the company Birchwix, with their omnidirectional treadmill of creating a game for their system, and that was shown on Shark Tank, ABC Shark Tank, back in December of this year. Have you guys seen, have you guys all seen Shark Tank before, at least know what it is? Essentially, it's a panel of investors that come on board and people come up, and companies come up and pitch their product to try to get investment. The, the Virtuix Omni is an omnidirectional treadmill. So imagine that you're in the gym and you're exercising like you normally do. In some cases, they actually have the, a game in front of you that the faster you run, you can collect points, you can compete with other players and such. That's sort of a traditional, um, I shouldn't say traditional, over the last 10 years or so, companies have been developing these interactive game-like treadmill machines for exercise. This is a little bit different because it's an omnidirectional treadmill, so you can physically turn around 180 degrees if you wish. So imagine that you're, you know, you're fighting the bad guys, then he, he pulls out, they pull out the big guns. You first thing you might do just instinctively, you might even not, not even think about it, is just turn around and you know run as fast as you can. You can actually do that with this treadmill. It's pretty cool. So with that, I'll show a short clip of that show. Because Jan, the CEO of Virtuix, he really explains virtual reality well. I think maybe perhaps better than I can describe it. So he'll show it and also he'll explain it as well as show it with his words here. Okay, so that kind of gives you an idea of what it's like, although you have to obviously try it yourself to get the full experience. The, shark, the sharks loved what they had, but Jan was asking for far too much money than what they're normally used to investing in. It was actually, he would value the company at $20 million and was asking for $2 million, which was more than anyone had ever asked for in the history of Shark Tank. And so they gave him a really hard time, did not invest in Virtuix, and Jan continued on, of course. I just read this morning that Mark Cuban, one of the sharks, was one of the investors that put $3 million into the company. So they're finally starting to believe that this is actually taking off and it's becoming real. Whereas you know, just a few months ago, they didn't believe this would actually take off. It may have something to do with the Facebook acquisition of Oculus for $2 billion. I suspect that he got very interested at that point. <coughs> So some of, I know some people have been kind of upset thinking about well, Facebook, what do they have to do with virtual reality? Well, it's now nothing other than they bought Oculus. It's actually, I believe very strongly, it's a very good thing, even if it is Facebook. The reason for that is because it gives credibility to what we do with virtual reality. And now other investors are going to be able to come in and provide funding so that we're able to really make these experiences the best we can be. We can only do so much kind of in our spare time if we can actually, you know, get funding to you know build studios and such that you all have the capability to do, it will be much easier to do that because Facebook has basically validated the market. As well as others such as Sony recently announced a head mounted display that will be coming on the market soon. And plenty of other companies as well. Lots of head mounted displays are coming out on the market. A little bit of history. Here is what I call old school virtual reality. This is a project that we worked with General Motors on about 15 years ago in something called a, a, a cave. A cave is a very different type of display than a head-mounted display. A cave is actually a physical room. You can actually see the edges of the walls. These are walls. This is the front wall. This is the side. And this is the floor of the room that you actually sit in. And these stereoscopic images are projected onto those walls. You have head tracking, so the system knows where you're looking and how you move your head and such. It's a very compelling experience. You actually feel like you're 
you're in that automobile here instead of in a room with images on the walls. The walls actually start to disappear because you're seeing that and each eye is seeing a different image. And so you have this sense of, of depth, kind of like a, um, a 3D television, except you're completely surrounded by that. And I show this because this is an example of where virtual reality has been, but it wasn't available in the living room, right? You couldn't put this display in your living room. There were other head-mounted displays. They were sometimes $100,000 or more. So it wasn't going to be in your living room unless you were well, someone like Mark Cuban. Maybe he had it in his living room. But most of us didn't have access to it. Now we can have access to that. It doesn't cost. These systems started at somewhere around $500,000, million, $500, not $500 million. <laughs> I'd be a bit extensive. But in other cases, they completely have designed the buildings to go around these caves. Very expensive that not all of us have access to. So this is a very exciting time for us as that are indie developers and such because anyone is now able to develop these virtual reality experiences. Now head-mounted displays, that's exactly what an Oculus Rift is, is the display you put on your face is tracked so you can look around so you're completely surrounded by the virtual world. That's not a new thing. Oculus, they've done it very well. They've, um, I, they're doing amazing things. I was a little skeptical when they first came out because I knew how hard of a problem it was. But they've proven over and over again that they're doing things right, right and creating a very compelling hardware as well as software. And so I'm very happy that what they've done with virtual reality to bring it to the masses. Head-mounted displays actually have been around for quite a while. I just saw Steve Ellis of uh, NASA Ames Research Center. He had this slide at the IEEE Virtual Reality Conference a couple weeks ago, and he claimed, it's, it's kind of commonly uh, quoted that Ivan Sutherland at the University of Utah back in the 60s created the first head-mounted display. That's, what, 40 or 50 years ago? But it actually goes back further than that. According to Steve Ellis, he traced it back, and he also claims that it goes back all the way back to Galileo. He created the first head-mounted display in order to determine his location when you know for navigating ships and such. And so this has been around quite a while and is continuing to evolve. Oculus has just taken it to the next level and brought it to the masses and done it very well. And also the technology is starting to catch up, so it's at an affordable price now, so that we can all have access to it. So these virtual realities have been around a while. However, we haven't all had access to it to a massive number of developers. It's often consisted of programmer art or scientific visualization that doesn't have that aesthetic appeal that we have, that a lot of people in this room have as game developers. This really is a new artistic medium that artists now are able to create experiences to be able to create this com compelling content that just blows us away that we just didn't have access to, you know, 10, 15 years ago because, and, and you know, nothing against programmers, I'm a programmer myself, but you don't want to see my art, right? It's a pretty, I might have, you know, the bad guys might be, you know, consist of cubes, that's my art, right? And so we need artists, we need designers, we need um, psychologists. It's a very much multidisciplinary field that now that this is accessible to everyone, we're able to access all those different fields, all those different types of individuals that we need. And why I say it's new is because this is completely different than traditional video games. The screen completely disappears. So you start, you stop perceiving this display that's fixed in space out in front of you. With a wide field of view, you kind of lose yourself and you don't even pay attention anymore to the edges of the screen once you get really engaged in the game. And you can, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you can completely turn around. And so that you're just in the world instead of looking into a window into the virtual world. You're completely immersed in it. And because of that, a lot of concepts in traditional video game design no longer apply. We have to rethink that entire process. And so the best virtual reality games will be designed from the beginning for virtual reality. And so some companies have ported some of their existing games to the Oculus Rift, for example, which is good. That's important because we got to start somewhere. But to really make those games compelling, we have to start from the beginning. And part of the reason for that is something called uh, simulator sickness that I'll be talking a little bit later. It's similar to uh, car sickness or going on a carnival ride. 
some people are just going to get sick because it's a very intense experience and there's some uh, physiological things going on in the human body that we can't solve technically. And so we have to be very careful how we design the games and keep those you know, thoughts in our minds. I know um, some games that have been ported to the Oculus Rift, you know, the character in a regular game, it's okay if your character runs at 20 miles an hour. But in virtual reality, if you run at 20 miles an hour, something's not going to be right. Or 2D text on a display screen now needs to be true 3D. You, can, you can't have like occlusion issues, uh, the text going through walls and such. And so those are things we need to think about. Now today, Oculus is doing a very good job of selling the technology as well as some of the other companies. However, one of the reasons why Oculus is so successful is because they're selling the story. They're selling the excitement. They're selling the emotion of what virtual reality can bring us. And that's one of the reasons why they're doing so well. Other companies have, you know, have built head-mounted displays and attempted to sell them. I strongly believe that's one of the reasons why Oculus is so successful. That's sort of how they started. They had, didn't have 20 years of experience building these virtual reality experiences. However, because they were able to build that excitement, they were able to create, you know, hire some of the best game developers there are. They got, um, they got John Carmack, they have Michael Abrish, some of these just like, you know, these gods in the computer um, game development community. They've been able to attract that because they built that excitement to get those people. And so as we continue into the future, we need to be you know, very careful of that. And me as a technical programmer, I sometimes forget about that. And so we just all need to remember that it's the experience we're selling, not the technology we're selling. That will become more and more, more, and more important as different um, studios come in and compete in the space. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some details of some example um, work I've done and some concepts that you could apply in your development for virtual reality. I mentioned earlier that we kind of need to think from the beginning how the interface is different than it is in a traditional game. In a traditional game, you're not tracking your hand, so it makes sense to put up information on the display just maybe down in the corner of the screen, your health bar or whatever it might be. The problem with that is in a, a wide field of view head mounted display, if you put it down in the corner of the screen, it's like way down here. It's on the edge of my vision where I don't have high visual acuity, and so that may not be the right space for it. So maybe it needs to be actually in physical space or attached to your body in some way. So when you want to see something, you you know kind of look down to the side. The similar that maybe you know you look at a, a watch on your hand. And so what I did here, the original uh, Six Sense Entertainment with the Razer Hydros. The Razer Hydros are these handheld track controllers that track the orientation and position of the hands. And so you can kind of you know move around and see your virtual hands move around. They simply have their um, the mapping of the buttons the instructions of what the controller does up in front of you which was useful but then it kind of got in the way and it was a little bit distracting what happens you know if i don't want that there or figure out how to turn it off and such so what i did here was just extremely simple i mean this literally took, took 10 minutes to do so there's nothing complicated about these things but you know sometimes in, in well almost all the time in design if you can take something complicated and simplify it to its simplest forms, that's where the real power comes, where anyone's able to use that and making something complicated very simple. So all I did was I took those mappings that normally came up in front of your screen, split the image in half, so I had an image of uh, the mappings for the left hand, the right hand, and then I attached them to the hands, and now wherever I move the hands, my hands here, so it makes sense, okay, if I wanna see what the mapping does for this button where my thumb approximately is, then I just you know, label where that thumb approximately is. So I look at my hand, and now I know what that thumb button does. And so that way you can be able to just you know, look down where the interface is instead of this kind of indirect mapping. Again, this is something very simple, and I'm sure it will evolve you know, in maybe some more complicated interfaces. For example, you could, you know, when you push a button, you could highlight the button in your hand sort of thing. So these simple concepts of design will be important as we move forward. Not necessarily complicated, just we need to get creative and think outside of traditional user interfaces in game development. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention here that's very important is you can see the user sees some sort of body. Well, it's not like that body's on a screen out in front of the user. Remember, the screen kind of disappeared. You're immersed in the world. You're surrounded by the data. Well, my lower body, my legs, is part of that immersion. I look down 
and I see my own feet in the approximate location where my feet are. And it turns out that's extremely compelling, especially for uh, something called presence that Oculus and others often talk about, that sense of being there. Well, if you just have this viewpoint, this camera floating through space, not attached to a body, it's very weird to look down and not see anything. It's like you're just kind of floating in space somewhere. So if you just have even a rough approximation of where the body is, that's extremely compelling. And then if you have the track hand, such as in this case, when you see this, even those hands don't need to be photorealistic. It's just, they don't need to be the same color of your skin. You don't have to have the same color of jeans on. To be able to see your body move around as if it's that same location of your body, it's a complete different experience. And that causes people to get that sense of presence, to really feel like you're taking on being that character, being that avatar. Okay, we'll move on. Another, to even add more onto that is to have these avatars. If you're tracking the, you know, even if you're simply tracking the head, the hands, and perhaps you're tracking where the head's looking, such as you can do with the Oculus Rift, that can be extremely compelling as well because now you have this sort of natural communication via a very subtle body language. You don't have to think about Oh, I want to push, you know, what was the what was the button to surrender again? You don't have to think about that. Maybe you just hold up your hands. And so, for example, here, this is uh, my colleague, Paul. He's the other character. And when I shoot the gun at him, he's like, whoa, you know, I, I surrender. He just does it automatically. He might not even be thinking about that. And, for example, head tracking is another thing. Very subtle cues that you don't even think about maybe in a, a regular game. That sense of eye contact, even though we're not tracking the eyes, not yet anyway, that where is the head looking can be very compelling. So if they're looking in your direction, you know they're looking in your direction. It's a very one-on-one, -on -one, but different than video conferencing. One of the challenges with video conferencing is that you know the camera's over here and the screen's here. You lose that sense of eye contact. Here, we do have that sense of eye contact because the, the character is mapped in physical space where it should be. Okay, I mentioned earlier a little bit about simulator sickness. That's one of the real challenges of virtual reality. Just like um, the carnival rides that I mentioned. Some people it's not appropriate and they know they can't go on carnival rides. And maybe if they do it more and more, they can become accustomed to that and such. But what we can do is we can reduce that simulator sickness as much as possible. We can do things smart, we can be careful of the technology, we can be careful of the interface. All of those things we need to be very aware of. If you, for example, if you have a low frame rate, in a game, it's a, a traditional game, it's a little bit annoying. In virtual reality, if you're only rendering at 30 frames per second, it's not just annoying, it can make you physically sick. The reason for that is because the system thinks I'm looking over here, but a split second later, I'm looking over here, but it's still displaying what I was looking over there. Your brain gets confused. The reason why it gets confused is because we have a sense of balance in our inner ear called the vestibular system. It's that sense of balance, that sense of uh, deceleration, acceleration. If those kind of subtle cues of balance don't match what my eyeballs are seeing, then the brain gets very confused. And it says, wait a second, something's wrong here. Maybe I, from an evolutionary point of view, maybe I you know, ate some bad berries that were poisonous. Now I better you know, eject that out of my system and you know, get sick. That's one you know, theory of why that's the case. But it's really all it is, is, is a sensory cue conflict of your different senses being out of sync with each other. And that can cause simulators. So we understand the basics of simulator sickness, but this is very much an open, open research at this point of understanding it better. One of the challenges of understanding simulator sickness is the biggest factor in simulator sickness is the individual. Some things that I do, for example, I can you know, virtually back up with my controller in virtual reality and I feel fine or I can strafe to the left or right. I feel fine. Other people, sometimes that makes them sick. And maybe they can do some things that make me sick, but don't make them sick. And so that's one of the real challenges is they can very much be an individual, in some individuals, simulator sickness affects them in different ways. Now there's a blue arrow here that I want to talk about. What is that blue arrow? I, it's part of the interface, but it's not so much part of the interfaces. This is um, maybe a bold claim but that blue arrow helps reduce simulator sickness. What does that mean? 
It's all it is is a blue arrow. It's nothing complicated, right? There's no complicated algorithm here to understand. That's just a blue arrow out in the world. What it is, and I, this was me playing around. I didn't know if it would work, but I kind of had the idea. I realized that some virtual reality experiences are in a, say it's a driving game, or you're in some sort of cockpit. Well, that cockpit in the game is a stable world reference cube. No matter which way I look, or no matter how I move forward, that cockpit is always going to be in the same position relative to my body. Right, if I fly forward, the world outside the window moves forward, but the cockpit stays in place. That cockpit is actually stabilized. It's a real world reference cube. No matter what I do, it's always physically in front of me. It's the same location as the physical keyboard. And that helps. That is, those are good games to develop for because people don't get nearly as, as sick in those systems because it's just like the real world, like, I was, like I'd be sitting in a car. And also the periphery, the wide field of view, we tend to have that sense of affection more when something moves in the periphery versus our central part of our field of view. Infection is, uh, if any of you have been sitting in a parking lot, maybe you're kind of looking down or something, then a bus or something moves in your periphery, and you kind of, you feel that sense, what, you, whoa, what happened? You actually feel that sense of self-motion even though you didn't move? That's an illusion. The same thing happens, happens with uh, virtual reality. When something moves in your periphery, or the entire field of view moves, you get that same sense of affection, which kind of makes you feel a little bit funny, and you continue doing that when you do similar things. So this blue arrow, I thought, okay, a first-person shooter is not appropriate to have a cockpit, because it'd be weird, right? because maybe if you're a mech bot or something, it might make sense. But just if you're walking around, you can't have a cockpit around. So I thought, what if I could add some sort of artificial, um, real-world reference cues that are stable in the physical space? Would that help reduce simulator signals? And for me, it made much more, a bigger impact than I thought. Because I could, if I started feeling kind of, feeling that sense of action, I could focus on that arrow and realize, okay, let's kind of ignore everything that's, you know, in the world moving as I virtually walk forward, and focus on that arrow and think about that as something that's physical in the real world. And for me, it felt like, wow, this feels a lot better. And the few people that I had tested out, they felt, they, they commented on that as well. And so this, we haven't done any formal user studies or anything on this, but this is an example of what we can experiment with and you know, further investigate. We don't have all the answers yet, but this is exciting times because it's wide open. Any of us can try these things. Now, all we need is an Oculus Rift, or all we need is you know, the Sony HMD coming out. And all of us can start experimenting. A lot of those experiments may go bad, but some of those things are going to be pretty exciting as far as um, you know, what we can do and what helps create these more compelling virtual worlds. OK, another topic is something called coordinate systems. And all of you that have developed for you know, traditional video games, you understand that you have these different coordinate systems, right? You have the camera coordinate system, you have the world coordinate system. Virtual reality is no different. In this game I have, I'm showing here, this, you can see several different things. It's a little confusing, again, without trying it, because it's something you have to actually experience. And so while it's a little difficult to describe, when you see it, you kind of get it immediately. What are these different visual cues that are just you know, more than the, the world? And so again, you see the blue arrows. You can see I added more blue arrows, and that was us saying is that's what, what the forward direction is. That is what that physical representation is. So as I move around, you have this sort of a real world reference cue to reduce that simulator sense. Adding more of those blue arrows, and now this is just kind of the direction my physical torso is facing, so I know which way's forward. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is some people mentioned that, you know, for example, Oculus, they suggest that move the player in the direction you're looking. So if I push the controller forward, if I'm facing this way, then move this way. However, if I turn my head this way, then move this way. That's fine, but when you add an avatar where you're actually seeing your own body, that becomes very weird because if I turn my head like this, what happens to your torso? Your torso is still facing this way. But what does the avatar move this way when you only move your head? It's sort of an unknown. In my case, I said, let's always assume the torso is facing this way, and I can look down and see my body, my torso is still forward, but I'm looking to the left, now I can walk in this direction. 
instead of looking in this direction. And then there's no, it, it's a little bit better as far as the representation of the, uh, the, your own body when you look down. Just like it's more like the real world. So these blue arrows, you're not actually looking down, always looking down at your body. So instead I put, another reason I put these blue arrows, so you always have an idea of which direction your torso is. So now when I push the controller forward, I realize, okay, even though I'm facing this way, the blue arrows are in this direction. So my mind just gets accustomed to saying, to thinking, oh, okay, forward is in the direction of the arrows, not necessarily the direction I'm looking. That gives you more control so you can look all around as you're moving throughout the world. So that's one example of um, a coordinate system, which is just the bot, what I call the body-centric coordinate system. Which way is my torso facing? Of course, we also have the, the game coordinate system, right? And you all know that from the games, which way is north? And if you look at the bottom of this image, what I did here was I surrounded the user by a compass. So if they get lost, it's very easy to get lost in these virtual worlds, because if you virtually rotate, you forget. In the real world, it can be difficult enough to remember which way is north. But in virtual worlds, you become lost very easily, especially in more complicated maps. In this virtual world I have here, I completely, I forget where things were, even though I created the map. And so having that compass allows you to better be able to create that cognitive map of, okay, what is this, what is this world like? I'm trying to head in the northern direction, but if I rotate you know, all around virtually, I forget which way is north. And so you can kind of just look down and see the, the game world coordinate system and remember, oh, I'm heading north, I just need to always kind of go in the direction of this um, compass that I'm looking down that I'm surrounded by. Another coordinate system, of course, is the hand coordinate system. If we're doing hand tracking, such as the image I showed earlier, then you might have the user interface attached to that coordinate system. Another coordinate system I have in this example, because I'm not doing hand tracking in this case, I'm, I'm tracking the head. Which way am I looking? Well, this is a head-centric coordinate system. This kind of transparent target area there. So you know, if you want to target, here the lasers shoot out from as if you know your eyes are shooting out a laser from your eye. And so you're able to you know target things in the world that way. So that's yet yeah, another coordinate system that when we're designing, we have to think about how these how all these coordinate systems work together. However, when the user gets in there, they get it immediately. Because it's like a real world helmet. Oh, I'm looking all around, there's just this crosshair in front of me, similar to you know wearing a football helmet. And so these coordinate systems kind of maybe are a little bit hard to think about as we're developing, but when the user gets in there, they just get it automatically. Oh, okay, this is the compass, this is the blue arrows, I'm facing this way, these are my hands. It's sort of this very natural sort of user interface. Okay, and being that this is a serious games track, I had to put in this image here for a, a serious game that we're working on. We're working with the National Institute of Health on a a educational game for kids. This is uh, grades three through five, actually putting the kids into the game physically. And so imagine being able to physically crawl through a body to explore different, you know, different organs and such within the body. And so now, now it's no longer just a game of these visual and auditory cues. We have that uh, kinesthetic cue, that sense of your arms actually moving around because we're using the Sixth Sense Razor Hydros in order to track the hand. So you can kind of you know, crawl around physically with your hands. And we believe that by actually putting the, the kids in the game, now they're learning physically the same way that they you know, play. And this is applied specifically to neuroscience education, which can be kind of a very abstract thing, especially for kids. But we believe if we you know, physically put them in something, then they you know, remember much better. After all, we're competing with <laughs> all the great games you guys are creating. So we have to really, you know, what is the next thing to really you know, get these kids engaged in the games. And the real idea behind this is, this is applied towards, on, as I mentioned, neuroscience education. And so it's not just necessarily, you know, remember what organ this is and what is it's called. I'm personally interested in more higher level concepts versus just memorizing different parts of the body. And so in this game, we're shooting to teach kind of self-awareness of our own thoughts, of our own actions. So imagine, and this is, could be useful for us as adults as well. Imagine you know, teaching kids that you know, when something happens in the world, say you get bullied or you get teased or something to that effect, 
imagine kids being able to step back and realize, oh, you know, I'm having this audit and some stimulus happened in the world and I'm having this sort of automatic response. Then realizing, oh, that's just the, you know, my amygdala or that's, you know, some part of my brain reacting in a certain way. However, then realizing, oh, wow, this is happening again. And then realizing, you know, that is happening, that's my automatic response, but because now I'm aware of it, I can step back and say, you know, maybe that response isn't the most, isn't appropriate in this situation. Maybe it would be more empowering to be able to choose something different, to react different, you know, to call the bully out on what he's doing, or, you know, whatever that might be, given this specific situation. So being able to you know become help them become more aware of their own thoughts of you know how their brains work and such. Okay, that kind of sums up what um, or this slide kind of sums up what we talked about. That there's lots of things to think about from a design point of view, from a technical implementation point of view, of uh, you know creating that compelling art and how to actually it's very important to embed things in the world and think about things as if they were real world objects, make it as real as possible, but then continue beyond what you can do in reality. You know, you, in reality, we don't have this, you know, interface in the world that you can reach out and touch things or, you know, manipulate objects at a distance, it's, you know, like magic. But first we have to make it to be the real world so that it behaves like the real world. Otherwise, there'll be challenges with uh, simulator sickness and such. Now, the IEEE Virtual Reality Conference a couple weeks ago, uh, one of my um, one of my mentors, he gave the keynote about virtual reality, and he was so excited about the Facebook acquisition because that validated, you know, what he's been doing for, just forever since the early '80s, working on virtual reality, and he saw that as this validates what we've been doing for you know a very long time, and now people are taking this seriously. Now there's going to be you know you guys out there also contributing to what we're doing, and to be able to bring in funding, to be able to get people excited, to bring this to, you know, where, to, where the entire world will be able to eventually experience it. So he was super excited. And what was really inspiring is what he said about few people, whatever their career is, if they're in biotech, if they're, you know, have a desk job, whatever it might be, they're doing sort of these iterative changes. These, you know, they're improving things, but it's a very slow pace because it's very complicated. These technologies have been out in the market for a while. But with virtual reality, it's something brand new, at least outside of the research field. It's open to anyone. That we really do have the opportunity to change the world, to you know, have, teach the serious game concepts, for example, or just you know entertainment uh, purposes. To have something that you know will remember, like the grandma I remember that said, you know. Well, one thing she said is, I'm going to remember this the rest of my life, even though she was 90 years old. That people will remember these experiences of offering these compelling, sort of engaging stories, maybe, you know, applying how that applies to their real life. It's just completely wide open. We have, you know, a major opportunity there. And Palmer Lucky, 20 years old, right, when he started Oculus, two years ago. He didn't have 20 years of experience. He didn't have, you know, a bunch of advanced degrees, he was able to create that because he was able to access the technology that's available now at an affordable price. And if in two years he can create what he's created, what's stopping us from doing, you know, creating great things ourselves? So if a 20 year old kid can do it, what about us as a community all coming together? We have that opportunity. And what, um, what Dr. Fuchs said as well, he said, let's not blow it. Right? Let's uh, try to do this right. Let's be passionate about what we're doing. Let's create these worlds some of us have been dreaming of for about 20 years. Okay, with that I'd like to mention some upcoming events that I'll be participating in. Um, here in about, what is that, about two weeks ago, well, two weeks away, I'm sorry, we'll be at the Neuro Gaming Conference in San Francisco. And the idea there is to take neuroscience concepts such as, you know, sensing EEG sensors and such, and, you know, sensing what the brain is actually doing, and what can we do to incorporate, to integrate together virtual reality technologies with neuroscience technologies. That is a completely wide open field. There's some people that have been playing around with it, but something that's wide open. I saw a talk a couple weeks ago where it was a virtual mirror, virtual reality, augmented reality sort of experience. You looked in the mirror, 
the player had the sensors on his head, he looked in the mirror, saw a virtual representation of himself, and the sensors would read what you know what different parts of his brains were being activated. He could look in the mirror, and as he could watch, actually watch his thoughts occur, overlaid on his brain in the mirror. Right? That's like one of the, but again, pretty simple, but just one of the coolest things. Like, wow, I never thought of that. You know, any of us could have done that. Pretty cool stuff. At that conference, we'll also have uh, Palmer Lucky, the founder of uh, Oculus, and Richard Marks, the developer of the PlayStation Move, and also one of the key players in the, um, in the Sony head-mounted display, the Morpheus that uh, was just recently announced. They'll be, on the, they'll be on the same panel. I don't know if those guys have ever been in the same room, so we hope to get a little controversial and a little <coughs> over there. We'll see what happens. The Silicon uh, Valley Virtual Reality Conference, if any of you are out there are in California, or it might even be worth traveling if you really want to get serious about this. I, I'm definitely going to be there. We have some great speakers as well. We have Jan, CEO of Virtuix, that we showed the omnidirectional treadmill earlier. Again, Richard Marks, Tom or Lucky are going to be there, as well as some other pretty amazing speakers that you know are really the visionaries in this field. And a little bit after that is the Augmented World Expo, again, in the San Jose area. And that is something that deals more with augmented reality, which is a little bit different than virtual reality but a lot of similarities, similar concepts. Here, instead of those blue arrows I talked about, that the real world being represented by this cue that matches the real world, augmented reality is the inverse of that. It's taking the real world and embedding computer-generated imagery within that real world. Again, something that you kind of have to you see or experience that's difficult to say in words. And lastly, this has not formally been announced yet, but at Seagraph in Vancouver this year, we're actually, um, I'm working with the committee now on putting together a panel of some of these leading experts in virtual reality to make virtual reality is on par with the keynote of the conference. It's going to be a primary theme of the conference this year that we're gonna have some big speakers there. And what may be even more interesting to this audience is that we're putting together a contest where different people can submit their material of virtual reality experiences, whether they've been working on them the entire year, and we still have some time left, right? This is until August, and so if you believe you have some really compelling ideas for virtual reality, you'll be able to submit to that, and we'll be, you know, have a panel of judges looking at those submissions and the best experiences. We'll be showcasing those at Seagraph and making a big deal of them. So, give us your opportunity to show some, you know, cool ideas that you've had, maybe you've already been developing for virtual reality gives you a chance to you know, show it to the world, to show it to a large audience. Okay, with that, we'll open the floor for questions. I also wanted to mention, you can of course contact me here at my email address, and also my, my Twitter, you can contact me there. Okay, we have a question. Uh, so you spoke a lot about uh, body presence and virtual reality. I'm, I'm wondering how you see uh, haptics fitting into that, and how you see that being implemented as well. Absolutely, so haptics is a big deal. I talked about that sense of kind of proprioception is self motion, but that's only, that's, you know, I have the controllers. Well, in some sense, that's passive feedback because I, I feel, oh, at least I have something physical in my hand. So if I have a sword or a gun or whatever in my hand, at least I feel something, which is very different than Microsoft Connect because there, you know, there's advantages of each. It depends, the Connect works great for some games. And so there's not like one's better than the other, but if you have that, you know, if you're holding a physical gun, you expect to have a gun and that sense of the button of actually physically feeling something. So in some cases that's better. Now that's called passive haptics because the thing isn't actually vibrating. But there's other controllers out there that will, but you know, a, 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 a tumbler, right? That, you know, actually physically shakes. So that's one very simple case. There's some, a company called Tactical Haptics, which is using the uh, Six Sense Razor Hydra controllers that I talked about. They added a really compelling sense of, of touch and how they do, it's very interesting how they do that. And by itself, it's like, okay, this is kind of cool. I feel like this, the controller essentially moves. It's got some things that, you know, push on your skin. You can feel a move, it's really cool. But by them, it's pretty cool by itself. But when you put that in a virtual environment, now suddenly you're seeing it and you're feeling it, even though it's not, you know, like perfect like the real world. Combining those together starts to create this, uh, this illusion. Because generally vision dominates the sense of touch, not in a lot of cases. And so now you feel like, wow, that was really like I felt this recoil. That might not feel like a recoil if you didn't have the visual 
the visual, you know, compelling images embedded within the virtual world, not just on the screen. There's other things to do. I know um, back in the day, we used to, like, uh, when I was at UNC, we um, would physically model the room. And so you could go in, you know, visually you'd be like in a living room sort of environment, and you'd go up and you could physically touch something because the virtual world matched the physical, all they were were styrofoam blocks. You'd go up and you'd be like, okay, this is pretty cool. And it was a track space, so you could physically walk around in a, like a 20 by 10 feet area. And then you're like, okay, this is pretty cool. And we'd say, okay, well, you know, reach out and touch the table. And they'd do that, then they'd kind of freak out. They were, whoa, this really is real. And then they started to believe that, they'd touch other things. And then what we did is we um, said, okay, now let's walk into the next room. So they physically walk into the next room and they look down and there'd be a big hole in the floor. And now instinctively they learn this is the real world, what I see as a physical presence, and they freak out. And so we measured like, for example, heart rate, we measured palm sweat, you know, and it would spike when they went into the next room. And then what we did, we added one more thing, is we said, okay, but then if they walk out there, the illusion's going to be broken. We didn't, you know, dig a hole in the floor. We didn't go that far. But what we did do is we put an inch and a half um, a plywood an inch and a half thick. And we said, okay, you don't believe this? Go up, walk to the edge, and put your toe over the edge of the, we call it the diving board over the, over the floor. And then they get a, even more of a spike in their heart. <laughs> now those are passive haptics. Active haptics is something that, you know, physically might, um, you reach out and touch something and you have, well, there's this phantom devices. Are you familiar with those? There's different types of devices that you um, actually model, just as you model the, the visually geometry. This model is a physical, it's like a robotic arm, the inverse of a robot. It's able to um, control where you're touching. It knows exactly where you are in space and applies physical forces. So if I have this virtual object, it will sense that you know I intersected that object, then apply a force back to keep you from moving through that. And that's even more than because then you can dynamically change the model and such. Or you could, uh, for artists, it's great because you can go in there and you know actually do um, you know sculpting and fill the surface. Yeah, and specifically, what I was wondering about was the, uh, the sensation of picking a thing up on ah, the ground. Yeah, because that's naturally going to be very hard because yep. you can't really just add weight to something on your arm. Yep. And that's so the tactical haptics guy, they, the guys, they kind of do that, but that's one of the big challenges, right? How do you change the weight of something? I don't know, maybe there's like some crazy electromagnetics thing when you pick it up and suddenly, you know, turns on the magnet or something like that. Uh, there's also other, what's that? Or something with water, perhaps. Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it's wide open. And that's why it's such an exciting, you know, I can't think of it right now, but I'm sure some of you maybe have some ideas. Another challenge is when you physically, you know, if I have this virtual wall here and I virtually walk through it, there's nothing stopping me. Right. So what happens, do I go through the wall because I physically walk forward, or do I stop the virtual world and say, no, you can't move any further? It's like, wait a second, I kept walking. I walked another five feet. Why is the world not updating appropriately? And so again, there's these cue conflicts that creates this uh, big challenge. Well, these virtuous doesn't matter that much with that. They've solved some of that, exactly. And people have done the treadmills, for example. They've had these crazy treadmills that take up like an entire room that are sort of this um, active treadmills that you start walking and then the treadmill starts moving just like a regular treadmill, except um, or an escalator, for example, or a moving sidewalk. But you kind of, you almost trip when you do that, because it's like, well, something started to move, but I didn't you know, physically move, start walking, and there's all these challenges. But what Jan did with Virtuix is he was able to you know, totally rethink and say, what if we make a passive treadmill? Or basically, you know, it's not the actual surface moving. Let's put it down to its simplest form. We don't have moving parts. And it's almost sort of like on roller skates. It's kind of what it feels like. Not quite like real walking, but maybe that's okay. Maybe that's better than these, you know, huge, expensive mechanical systems. Any other questions? There we go. So you uh, you started the serious game uh, before about you know, like if you're trying to change like perception of like a user using VR. Um, it's how 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 would you how would you do that? Yep. How would you do that from from like maybe trying to make perception of the user, but from like 
not from like a physical, from like like they're trying to they're doing an act. You brought up bullying, for example. So I'm sorry, what was that last part? You brought up bullying, for example. Bullying. Oh, bullying. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You brought up that, for example. Um, how how would you do that mm -hmm. in like like a demo, person, for example, mm -hmm. and really change that perception? Because it's a thing where like if it's not realistic, if you give it to like an eight year old or a seven year old, they're just like, oh, it's just game. Mm -hmm. But the perception, the actual perception, in my in my opinion or how I view it, won't really change. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'm just saying. But how would you? So my colleague uh, Tabitha Peck at Duke University, she's done some amazing things studying, for example, gender differences or racial differences. What if you put someone in the avatar of a female, even though you're male? And how can you make them feel real? And there's different people have done studies like that. They actually found a difference that people start having an empathy. Oh, I understand how it is to you know, be the opposite sex and be discriminated against, for example. Uh, for me, it's very compelling. Even if they're just cartoon hands, it's not, you know, we all want photorealism. Those are important for some things, but it doesn't necessarily need to be photorealistic. I think there's more important things, like a wide field of view is very important, and the sense of motion is more important in some cases than the visual field of view. Remember in graduate uh, school, I had a, a colleague, Paul Simmons, that was looking at your, your sense of presence in virtual environments, and he'd like model this really nice room, then he compared it to this very grid-like room where you could see, you know, this grid with uh, going off in the distance. And so, you know, the further off something is, you have this very nice sense of visual cues that you might not have as much with, you know, a plastered wall that doesn't have that. And um, he found, at least the early preliminary findings were, some people actually felt more present in that grid-like room because they had more of a sense, well, he hypothesized it was because you had more a sense of depth. You actually had enhanced visual cues. And so it doesn't necessarily need to be you know, photorealistic. If I look down and it's a different color shirt than what I'm wearing, I'm not going to remember what shirt I was. I'm, just, I'm going to be, wow, my hands. It may not even look like my hands, just to have something like that. Another way to do that is, uh, this is where it gets very interesting from like a psychological point of view and why it's important to have psychological, psychologists, psycholo psychologists, there we go, involved with our work. Uh, so what they've done, they put him in the avatar. People are like, okay, this is cool. Yeah, I get it. This is kind of my body. And part of that is you don't always look at your body, right? So they'll have like virtual mirrors that you can see yourself as well as look down and see your own body. What they also did is they said, okay, here's a virtual feather. Now we're going to, you know, touch your arm with this feather. Get back to your question about haptics, not a very, you know, technically advanced form of haptics, but the uh, researcher would then come up and have a real feather and rub their arm with the real feather as the virtual feather did the same thing. Well, that was pretty compelling. Well, I, not, I don't necessarily mean like from the physical, more so from like the mental. Like if mm -hmm. a kid sees this, mm -hmm. and okay, say it's the, um, the kid that is getting bullied mm -hmm. is doing the simulator, ah. and you're having like, you're, you're trying to get him to either stand up for himself or to get a reaction, you know? Um, that's really what I mean. I said necessarily from the physical point of so. So from the point of view of the bully or the person being bullied? Either. Just Either. to get them to change their mental, their, yep. their mental thing. Well, maybe related, and again, this I don't know the answers to all these things. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, but it's a good question, and sometimes when you don't know the answer, that probably means it's a good question, right? Uh, but going back to the gender <coughs> differences, they actually found that that would change how people thought of, you know, oh, I'm making you know, these sexist remarks or something, you don't think nothing of them maybe as a guy because you never thought about it, but if you put them in the, in the, from the female perspective, then suddenly they start thinking, oh, wow, you can, you can have empathy with, the, with female females now. Realize, oh, wow, that felt pretty horrible. Or, you know, changing their sense of height, this change, you know, and how people realize, oh, you know, people experience the world differently if they're a different height. Another example of that is uh, public speaking. There's been studies where they put someone in a virtual room with a virtual uh, avatar audience. And the psychology of that is, is pretty cool stuff. But they, they've done studies like, you know, the audience, like you guys are paying attention to me, right? So it's easy for me. But what happens if the audience is nodding off or people are, you know, not paying any attention, they're looking at their cell phones? What happens? And they found that makes a huge difference when they put people in these virtual environments. Even though they're just cartoon characters, they're so obviously not real, their behavior actually suggests that they do believe these characters are real. 
powder grill. And in the extreme case, what they do, they had uh, one of the very, one of the attend attendees of the practicing of the speech get up and scream and run out of the room. And so that was a good example how you can uh, you can play. With yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's been a lot of research over the last like 30 years applied towards uh, jet fighter pilots that you know and what's interesting about that is there's a lot of data the problem is it's not arguably not valid data the reason why is because if you're a jet fighter pilot and you report simulator sickness it's probably going to be a while before you fly again so they drastically underestimated how many people get simulator sickness. The general finding was there, yeah, don't do you know stupid things, don't do crazy things, but it's not that bad. And now, you know, we're hopefully we'll get more of an honest feedback on that. Um, there's some uh, academic research on that, but it's not really brought together. I'm trying to think offhand a website or something for that. It's something personally I want to get, do more research on and you know test those blue arrows, for example. Like, that's my hypothesis, I test it, I'm obviously biased. Maybe my users are biased because I say, hey, try this, it's cool, right? But unbiased, true, formal studies, that's, I think for, you know, this sort of virtual reality that are not, you know, these high-end simulators is completely open. So sorry, I couldn't answer better on that. And uh, if we're about to wrap up, so I'll answer this real quick, then we can talk afterwards. This is kind of the situation with sim sickness thing. I was curious if anyone done anything with testing out with like drowning or a ginger yeah. snatch as far as avoiding or reducing yeah. uh, nausea or yeah. So when I was working with Val, that was kind of the joke. Like I came in one day because you know I was doing crazy, the high these crazy head mounted displays before where Oculus came out, and uh, you know someone had, had taped some some of that to my desk, right? And so that was kind of the joke. But some I've never tried it, but others have reported that they have and that it works. Again, that's bias because, you know, maybe it's the placebo effect. We don't know. But um, then again, my argument of the placebo effect is, well, psychologically, that's what's interesting is, fine if it's the placebo effect. Who cares? It works, right? But um, formal studies of that would be very interesting. I think it's one of those things that probably works for some people and doesn't for others. Just like, you know, real world when you go on the boat, it works for some people and not others. Whether it's placebo or not, we'll need to do, you know, formal studies for that. Okay, with that, we'll move on to our next speaker. And again, I invite you to come down to the Next Gen Interactions booth where we'll be showing the game uh, with Shark Tank. We won't have the Virtuix Omni, unfortunately. I try to get it here, but I um, won't be able to get it until uh, later this summer. So maybe next year I'll be able to show that full system here. And so come on down. I highly recommend to uh, stay for Richard Boyd's speech coming up next. He's has been doing virtual.